Um, to my chagrin, that that the 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 collapse of context and justification or explanation justification seems to still be applicable as we move into the second month of the war. And I think that this is important for those of us who are in the business of thinking and trying to understand without justifying how things happen in the world and, and, and why they happen. So I think that's number one. I think reactions, which is, which is tied to this as well, um, well, let me, before I get there, let me, let me say something about the war. So a lot of the conversation about the war is, is what kind of a war is it? Is it a war of survival? Is it a defensive war? Is it a just war? And one of the things that I've, um, uh, that I have understood and, ex and even experienced in terms of the, the, the emotions that are happening, um, at least among Jews, I can't speak to the Arab world. Questions of rage, questions of vengeance, questions of anger, all of those things are understandable where a foreign body breaks into the sovereign territory of a country and murders 1400 civilians. I mean, that is understandably cause for rage and anger and vengeance. But I think, um, and I want to throw this out, I think that one of the things that has not been sufficiently um, examined is, and I also think is, is, a, is a, a motivation on some way for the response as it is, is um, a deep sense of humiliation. I think Israel was humiliated. Whatever you want to make of it, and if we can just put aside, for example, the, the savagery of, of what happened, there was a deep humiliation. This was not supposed to happen. Yes, there could be terrorist attacks, and there could be this, and there could be that, but this kind of action was deeply humiliating to a country who basically, whose basic raison d'etre was that something like this doesn't happen. And I think to some extent, as much as this might be a war of defense, as much as it might be a just war, I think it's also a war of honor. There's a level at which um, the Jewish people writ large, but certainly Israel as a country was deeply humiliated. And at least in the in, in, the, in, in, in my you know, uh, orbit of discourse, I don't think that people are really quite acknowledging the extent to which that is the case. And I think, I think it really is important because humiliation is in some way what is driving some of the, um, some of the, the, the action, the, the responsive actions. So I want to um, say something about, um, I want to say something about a shift in narrative, because one of the things that's happening, there, the war is actually happening on many levels. There is, of course, the physical war, Israel's response to the Hamas massacre. But there's also, and this is true on the campus, I'm at, I'm at Harvard this year, so this is true on the Harvard campus, it's true on the Brown campus, it's true on a lot of campuses. This is also a war of narrative. Constructing different narratives. What is a legitimate narrative? What is an illegitimate narrative? And part of what I'm seeing is that we're, at least among, among the Jewish conversation, is that we're moving from a state of what I call fragile pluralism, where we can debate and contest different views on different matters having to do with Jews, having to do with the world, having to do with Israel, having to do with a lot of things, to a what I consider to be somewhat of a dangerous thing that I'm calling red line-ism. There are all these red lines being drawn all over the place. And in a certain sense, one of the interesting things that's happening is the slippage between the old red lines to the new red lines. So the old red lines of legitimacy within most of, not I shouldn't say most, but some of what we might call mainstream American Jewry was, was BDS. That was a red line. If you supported BDS for whatever reason, you were not invited to the table. You were not part of the conversation. Now, one can disagree with that, but I think that descriptively, 
that's not a, um, a particularly provocative comment. That's not to say whatever one may think of BDS, but I'm just saying that was considered to be a red line. But the red line has now shifted. The red line has now become not, you know, one who doesn't condemn the Hamas atrocity. The red line has almost become ceasefire. If you advocate a ceasefire, you've crossed the red line. If you advocate a ceasefire, you're on the side of Hamas. And this is a kind of very dangerous move because one can argue for or against ceasefire. But to argue that a ceasefire is a red line, that if one crosses that red line, one is no longer legitimately a part of a conversation, I find to be extremely problematic. And I'll give you one example. Some of you may have read the episode that happened very recently in the 92nd Street Y, where a Vietnamese author, very prominent author, winner of a Pulitzer Prize, who was invited to speak about his memoir, was disinvited by the board of the 92nd Street Y because he signed a letter published in the London Review of Books with 700 signatures calling for a ceasefire. That was enough to disinvite somebody from coming to speak. Now, the irony of him being the child of survivors of, Vietnam, of the Vietnam War in America is itself kind of interesting to think about. How somebody who experienced the atrocity of the Vietnam War from the Vietnamese perspective, who is sympathetic to the Palestinian cause and calling for a ceasefire, he's not, not condemning the atrocity but signed a letter calling for a ceasefire is an example of where we have actually come in terms of this new form of, 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 um, of red lineism. Or alternatively, um, an op-ed in the forward by Avi Mayer recently, which basically argued that anyone who doesn't unequivocally and without context condemn the Hamas massacre should no longer be considered part of the Jewish people. That's another kind of red lineism. Now, that's not going, that's not going in a good direction, to my mind. And I think it's worth those of us who are interested, certainly in, in the, the war of narrative, to really take that seriously. In terms of the Jewish community, it's kind of interesting in a way, certainly in America. I heard somebody give a talk yesterday that made the argument that what the war has produced in the Jewish community in America is a kind of consensus of solidarity that the Jewish mainstream or the Jewish community itself is now in, in, has come in defense of the state of Israel, has come to support the state of Israel in its actions, in, 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 its, in, the, in the war that it's calling a just war. And I really actually, um, I see it a little bit differently. I think that one of the things from my purview that has happened is that the Jewish left, or one might call it the Jewish far left, and this includes groups like If Not Now or JVP or Stand With Us or, or not Stand With Us, Stand Together, or a group of other, uh, another, uh, other parts of the progressive left, have actually occupied a space in the American Jewish narrative that they never really had before. When I saw the New York Times photograph of 3,000 Jews in Grand Central Station wearing black t-shirts that said Jews for ceasefire, that community of people, whether you identify with them or not, never had the voice that they have. Now, the progressive left is really involved in a very difficult, um, a very difficult, um, has a very difficult challenge. And by the way, before I came, Adi had sent me the letter 
Brown student letter that had just gone out. So I got a chance to read that. And there's another letter coming out um, that I helped the students in, gra in crafting um, for the Jews for Liberation at Harvard Divinity School, which is a letter that is much shorter to an op-ed, but, but similar to in sentiment to the Brown student letter. Um, the progressive left has, um, in a sense, tried to thread a very difficult needle in condemning the Hamas atrocity and supporting the Palestinian cause. It's not clear to me that it's going to be successful in doing that, but it seems to be engaged in that, in that process. I, I do want to speak about anti-Semitism for a moment, but maybe I'll, I'll wait till the end. In terms of, in terms of, um, what I, I, I just want to suggest something else that's very, that I find very troubling. And this speaks to another layer of the changed nature of discourse. I don't know if some of you have heard this or not, just from my, my space within social media, that the rhetoric has shifted from Israel has a right to defend itself, which I believe that it does. How it does that is a matter of debate, but Israel has a right to defend itself. It has shifted from that to a very strange and dark rhetoric of, the, of Israel as the liberators of the Palestinians from Hamas. That this war is a war of liberation. I find that incredibly troubling. First of all, it's classic colonialist language. Civilizing the American Indians, liberating Algeria. I mean, we can go down the list of the way in which people engage in armed conflict. In the case of the Native Americans, actual genocide and calling that liberation. And the extent to which I feel like that is moving into a dark place, I'm not really sure why that has caught fire in the narrative, but I find the very notion of bombing a territory as an act of liberation I don't even, I, I don't even really, uh, I don't really know what to say. I mean, it reminds me of Dick Cheney saying that if the U.S. toppled a Saddam, that they, they would be met by, with flowers, which obviously isn't the case. Or that the United States was liberating Afghanistan from the Taliban. Of course, we all know the Taliban now runs Afghanistan. So this idea of liberation, it's imperialist, it's colonialist, and I really feel like it doesn't, serve the purpose of making an argument that this is a legitimate defensive military action against a country's territory which has been breached and resulted in the murder of 1400 people. So I, I really just have to say that I don't know what's happening inside that orbit of, of, of a changing narrative, but I find that to be extremely troubling. I know that maybe it makes people feel good, but I don't think it really serves serves any purpose. I want to I want to conclude to talk, say a couple of things about about anti-Semitism. Um, some of us work on anti-Semitism, write about anti-Semitism, and the fact that anti-Semitism has seen a really a, 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 has has really increased on college campuses as the result of this that somehow. Certain segments of the population have seen this particular cause as a, uh, a reason to strike out against the Jews writ large is very, very troubling to me as a Jew, as a scholar, as a public Jew. But I also think that it doesn't sufficiently engage in navigating or negotiating the difference between a legitimate critique of a military action and anti-Semitism. 
and and maybe to some degree that's that's the point. Look, anti-Semites will latch on to anything that speaks poorly against the Jews, but to say that anybody that um, anybody that 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 doesn't support the Israeli cause is an anti-Semite is extreme form of weaponization. Now, I will say. I also feel like anybody that isn't willing to come out and unequivocally condemn mass death is a person that I don't have a conversation with. And so anyone that wants to say that this action of Hamas was an action of liberation or a legitimate action of resistance and is not willing to condemn mass death, I mean, that's anti-Semitic in my view. But there are many people who are not saying that. And, and I think to put everybody into the same category is both dangerous because in a, in a certain sense, it enables anti-Semites to exist under the radar of being, of, of those other people who are being, you know, anti-Israel for whatever reason. And it also, I don't think serves the purpose of the Jewish community which is trying to understand and deal with and respond to questions of anti-Semitism at the same time that we're watching on our computer screens the destruction of a collective body of people. I don't care if it's 10,000 or 8,000 or 6,000 um, with no end in sight. So I think that, you know... It, I just wanted to raise those issues because I think they all, in a certain sense, intersect with each other, and um, and I hope that uh, we could use that for uh, for conversation. So thank you very much.
fate of the power of words and images in terms of world structure. It's really hard for me to find the words. Uh, maybe first time in my life, really, so desperate that it's quite hard to find a way to describe what happened today. Um, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not detached from the events either. Uh, I grew up in Be'er Sheva. Be'er Sheva is in the south of Israel. Most of my family lives in Be'er Sheva, in Ashkelon, near the, uh, you know, the Gaza enclave. Um, uh, a close friend of mine was murdered in Ophakim along with his son. Uh, and many of my friends and family members, and close friends, uh, you know, lost lots of family and friends. Uh, I'm following the news with great despair, listening to the words and visions of destruction, visions of erasure, dismantling, flattening, deport deportation, and extermination, and the metaphors are coming back of the Holocaust, of the Nazis, of the human animals, the barbarians, and the barbaric uh, acts. Uh, amid all of this tragedy and despair, I found or hope to find some comfort in the story of Rachel Edry from of a kid. Uh, I don't know how many of you encountered the story. It became very viral. You could probably uh, look uh, and watch the news, especially also in, 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 in networks in English. Her story has already become a local myth, the story of local bravery, of resilience. Uh, the 65 years old has become a symbol of a survival after the, after she and her husband of uh, 45 years, the beat, were held for 17 hours at gunpoint in their home in of Kim, down 25 miles from Gaza. I heard another story hidden under the layers of national propaganda that is really covering the story. She has become uh, quite a, a myth of you know how she, with her tactics, fight the Hamas militants in her. It was in her own words and the way she told the story that reveals a different possibilities in history. I mean, just, uh, this is some of the images she, of course, made with uh, President Biden. So that's one of the, uh, easily she had uh, uh, already, I think, one uh, in Haifa, she had uh, graffiti, graffiti of the image and so on. So. Uh, but her story embodies within the, the potential for reconnecting the Palestinians and the Arab Jews, the Mizrahi Jewish history, as well as the reminder of the division between, between them created by the national violence. So the go story goes as follows. In interviews she gave uh, to the tele uh, television channels, she shared how during the 17 hours in which she were uh, both held uh, she and her husband as hostages, she managed to speak to the heart of the captures and even offered them tea, coffee, and cookies. Achel Edry was born in, and raised in Ofakim, uh, the daughter of parents who immigrated from Iran and Morocco. She grew up uh, in a tough uh, poverty, uh, um, very crowded home with their 12 siblings. At age 12, she was already cleaning uh, stairways to help support the family, and had quit school at 16. And at 24, she married David, the truck driver, and they had uh, three children. She has been working uh, for over 40 years in a cafeteria for soldiers at one of the bases. Rachel remembers exact, the exact uh, time when she and her husband left the shelter and went back to their house uh, on October 7th. Uh, it was six minutes past nine in the morning, she says. As we entered the house, I saw five what you call road violers with weapons entering my house through the window. They started shouting to us, Shahids, Shahids, Tanzim, martyrs, martyrs. I thought to myself, what do I do now? Thought of running towards the front door, but I knew they could shoot me in the back. We decided. Uh, um, to do what they say. They took our phone, they break it, uh, and they told us to go to the second floor. Threatening us with guns, they opened closets and threw all the stuff out of them. That morning, three squads of uh, Hamas uh, gunmen 
they came to the neighborhoods in, in Ophakim and opened fire on civilians. Five armed men who escaped from, this, uh, from the police, they are the ones that broke into the house of, of uh, Rachel and David. At first, I was, uh, um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm quoting uh, Rachel, at first I was sure they would kill us on the spot, Rachel said. I grabbed my husband's hand and told him to sit next to me, and whatever happens will happen. I started to say Shema Israel, but then I looked at the terrorists and saw that they were not doing anything. I heard the police downstairs, so at one point I told the gunman I'm diabetic, I need to take my insulin, and they agreed, and I went back, I went down uh, with one of them and the other stayed with my husband uh, upstairs. Four hours after, she and her husband were taken, uh, well, since they were taken hostages, Edry decided to offer them refreshments. I asked them if they wanted tea, coffee, or cookies. They told me to bring them. Part of this was due to my desire to bribe them, but part was due to my nature. I'm always uh, I used the hosting and respecting people. One of the terrorists uh, said to me, you remind me my mother. I told him, I am really your mother. I will help you. I will take care of you. What do you need? After they drank and he ate, they became much calmer. I asked them how old they were. One of them was 40, the rest were 25 years old, between 25 to 30 years old. There was one who was terrible. But the others, I started having conversation with. At one point, I even forgot for a moment that they were terrorists. A few hours later, later I, the first rescue attempt was made from the house. During the shootout, one of the gunmen was killed, and another was wounded in the end. In the end, uh, Edry, uh, Edry uh, hurried to reassure them. I told the wounded man, come, up, come show me. And then I bandages, I bandaged his hand and stopped uh, the bleeding. I gave him a glass of water and I told him to rest. And they saw that I was taking care of them, that I was supposedly in their best interest. After two hours, the wounded uh, soldiers got, uh, gunmen got up and was all pale. I told him that he all, uh, owed me, uh, he needs uh, something sweet. I asked the cops downstairs to bring a can of pineapple, and I fed him until he fell asleep. Towards 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I saw the young man was starting to look nervous again. I said to myself, they probably be hungry, which only uh, adds nervousness. I asked them, are you hungry? Uh, they are uh, hungry, they answered yes. I told them, don't worry, I will take care of you. I will bring you some food. I went downstairs again with one of the gunmen who accompanied me with the weapon and I asked the police officer to bring them something to eat. Right after that, they were calmer again. At this point, the wounded terrorist was barely conscious, uh, with consciousness. Another one was wanted to sleep. And uh, Rachel was left to sit uh, next to the two of them. I had the feeling that soon, as the night came, they uh, would be able to rescue me, and that I should uh, 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 bid my time. I told them, come on, you will teach me Arabic, and I will teach you Hebrew. One of them started singing songs by the other kids. The other kids is a very famous uh, musician in Israel today, so that he knows kind of music. And I sent them songs by Mukatum. I asked them, besides being martyrs, what else do you do? <laughs> one, day, one told me he had three sons and two daughters. And, the, and the, they both answered, we are martyrs. We are in Tanzim. Again, I tried to make a reconciliation between us. I told them, it's a shame that we fight all the time. Let's live in peace. Instead of, you know, in, in, in place where you are constantly being killed and we are constantly being killed. One said, just like you have soldiers, we have soldiers. I told him, but our soldiers are reasonable. They want 
hurt you, so your soldiers, if you don't start. Only around two in the morning, after 17 hours of uh, being hostages, was the operation uh, to a place uh, of the troops carried out and led the release of Rachel and her husband, in which the four Hamas militants were killed. So this is only a part of parts of conversation. In other places, she even says that she told them that she's brown and they are brown, and she thought that that's a connection that they can make it, and, and she's talking a lot about hospitality and, and so on. That is a, it's a real thing that she's, she's doing. It's an amazing stuff that's coming out of it, but of course, the, I'm going to talk about it now, how it's been framed, it's been framed differently. But Rachel's every story among the is the, among the only stories coming out of from the October 7th events presenting a human contact, a conversation which reveals cultural, linguistic, and human connection. We don't have completely that kind of, of stories coming out of the events, not in the say, October 7th, not from their own In this discourse, uh, uh, in the discourse dominated over the social media and television studios, there is a limited place for this kind of stories. The discourse is dominated by binary division between the human beings and the human animals, uh, and the animal story between the barbarians and civilized people, and between uh, natives and settlers. But her story suddenly brings back a different human discourse for a split second. It brings uh, back a history, historical and social and research connection that were forgotten and erased uh, I mean the ru ruins of violence and washed over uh, Israel uh, and Palestine. And in that reading of this story, it reminds us that there is a context uh, to the horrible, uh, violent events that's between Israel and Palestine since October 7. Again, when we uh, say uh, uh, it's also, uh, sorry, uh, remind us how dangerous current dehumanization discourse this day is. When, take, when talking about context, this does not justify uh, the atrocities and the killing that happens and the crime committed by Hamas and Obama. But there is a context. The context that the, this story opens for us is much broader than the history of the conflict that usually is what is about in the discussion. <coughs> there is a conflict, there is a history of the conflict, and so on. And the power relation between Israel and and Hamas and Israel and the Palestinians. This story reveals Israeli soci Israel's society's multidimensional structure and its uh, intersectionality with Palestinians. Mazal and David's story embodies within the story of the Mizrahim in Israel, uh, the Jews from the uh, Middle Eastern background, who were forcibly housed uh, uh, in the periphery, in the borders area, uh, after their immigration to Israel from North Africa. In the 19, during the 1950s and the 1960s, they were pushed to the geographical and social margins of the Israeli society, a group that suffered uh, discrimination for decades uh, in housing, infrastructure, education, and employment, whose Arab culture was being seen inferior and uh, the culture of the enemy, and who were forced to reject <coughs> the Arab uh, or the Arab roots and to serve as a Jewish protective wall on the borders. As a result of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, Gaza became a focal point for political and military confrontation. The impact of this conflict extended to these Mizrahi towns that were surrounding, or built surrounding Gaza. Uh, the, uh, these communities have been affected by the historic ongoing conflicts, as well as their proximity to the Gaza, uh, to the Gaza Street. Mazal uh, was, grew up in Ofakim. She was born in 1959. One of the Mizrahi development towns in the south of Israel. Most of the residents of this town were uh, Arab, Arab Jews who immigrated from Morocco, Tunisia, and Iraq. She grew up in uh, overcrowded slums, poverty, and limited possibilities. These Mizrahi towns were spaces where Arabic and Hebrew were spoken in mixture. And Arab culture was present in home, cafes, family gatherings, and in people's memory. The conversation she had with the Palestinian 
Hamas militants represent also a mutual cultural and social familiarity. The movement between Hebrew and Arabic in the conversation that they developed during their hours together, the connection and familiarity of Mizrahi music reveals the closeness of Gaza and Gazans to Israeli society and to Hebrew culture. It also reminds us to bring back history of the cross connection between Gaza and its surrounding cities, mainly the cities near the Gaza uh, Strip, uh, mainly the Mizrahi cities, but also the, the, the kibbutz and the other uh, uh, villages. The residents of Ofakim and Ashkelon, um, sorry, um, yeah, in, other, in, in the other days, when the border was open in the 70s and the 80s, uh, the residents of Ofakim, Ashkelon, Sderot, and the other Mizrahi communities surrounding the area uh, used to uh, would travel quite frequently to Gaza to shop in the market for stores, to spend time in the beach, to go to a dentist, to eat in the local uh, restaurants. But one should be careful idealizing this kind of encounters they took place under an Israeli occupation regime that began in 1967. Still, it was a human encounter and created a deep acquaintance. And I think in many ways for the Mizrahi Jews gave them you know, possibility to be again in Arab surrounding. Those days, Gaza there once again became a central city in the region which echoes the glorious times of the city in the turn of the 20th century, when Gaza was part of the Ottoman Empire and its residents were ethnic, ethnic, uh, 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 religiously and uh, ethnically uh, diverse, including Arabs, Jews, uh, Christians, and others. Uh, there was a big uh, Sephardi community uh, in Gaza. Uh, some of the older generation of Akimans, the world still remember this period. And, uh, and the direct bus lines that left Be'er Sheva and Ofakim for Gaza every day. This, uh, they also reflect on the times uh, they went to buy videota uh, videotapes uh, of Egyptian movies and Arabic music in the shops in Gaza. In Sterod, the elderly remembers the Gazan musicians who used to come and play in the local cafe together with the Moroccan Jewish musicians. These stories are fading uh, from the local discourse, and the younger generation have already grown up in the different reality, a reality which Gaza has been under siege since 2007. There is no way out, there is no coming in. The only contact with the Mizrahi population is the rockets that threatening the cities from the Gaza Strip. This brings to the fore another important context in the, that is, I think, central uh, to our discussion is the role uh, of violence in the formation of Mizrahi Arab Palestinian relations from the early 20th century to today. Uh, the relations were profoundly impacted by uh, violence, which transformed the dynamic perceptions uh, and experiences in, in both communities. The roots of these relations between, uh, viol uh, between violence and, uh, and Mizrahi Palestinian relations dates back to the early days of the uh, Zionist Palestinian conflict in Palestine. The end of the First World War uh, and the collapse of the Ottoman Empire was a dramatic moment uh, in the history of the Mizrahi community throughout uh, the Ottoman Empire. It was a time of shifting national and imperial orders, dismemberment uh, and partition of territories and the creation uh, of new political entities. The collapse of the Ottoman world utterly shattered the social and political structure of multiplicity that shaped the Sephardi political and social status. The Balfour Declaration and the British Mandate in Palestine brought a, a new political logic, the logic of partition and separation along the strict uh, national lines and competing loyalties. This Mizrahi liminal position that was there before, uh, and in many ways stayed after in a different way, uh, and their multiple identities and affiliations as Arabs, Ottomans, and Jews were transformed into a conflict in and opposing loyalties, uh, mainly uh, between association with the Zionist movement and affiliation with the Arab Palestinian neighbors. Their in between position became a source of suspicion and marginalization 
but the emerging Arab and uh, Jewish national movement. The uh, intensified national struggle and violence uh, event between Jews and Arabs, uh, or Palestinians Arabs, which began with the mandatory area and intensified in the ni uh, late 1920s and 1930s, has had a tragic consequences on the local Mizrahi communities who lived and work in mixed cities, uh, or mixed spaces, including the uh, Mizrahi uh, community that resided in, in Gaza for decades and had to live in the 1920s and 30s because of it. And, and, and only mentioning the, you know, the community that was in Hebron uh, and, and communities that used to live together in Jerusalem and moved to a separated Jerusalem uh, Arab uh, neighborhood because of this kind of violence. Clashes. So the ones that were the victims of these kind of clashes in the Jewish side usually being the Arab Jews or the local Jews, and the ones that suffered this kind of consequences of it, be separated even physically from the Arab neighbors, were these kind of communities. Sadly and ironically enough, the, now the, you know, some of the settlers want to go back to these kind of communities in Hebron. Sheikh Jarrah in Jerusalem and other places in Siwan, the, 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 the Sephardi used to live together and now to claim back the other inheritance of this, uh, you know, this kind of history. This social and political transformation left their mark on the lives and businesses of the local Muslim communities, the violence events uh, in Palestine. Uh, 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 in the 1920s, uh, most severely during the 1930s. <laughs> Uh, the strong ties with the local Arab Christians and Muslims neighborhoods helped them to maintain their position longer, longer than others, but they had to live in uh, strict uh, uh, national and social borders replaced social fluidity and shared life, forcing these local Mizrahi communities to choose between conflicting uh, national identities and religion. In this process, they were also uh, displaced from the official historical narrative. In a nationalistic and partition political reality, there was no place to the story of cross-border figures or communities who simultaneously embodied uh, Arab and Jewish histories, traditions, and identities. So it's also in the Zionist uh, you know, historiography, but also in the Arab historiography. Okay, so both these communities were uh, you know, being marginalized from both times. 1948 war and uh, the Nakba and the mass immigration of the Arab Jews to Israel only intensified this kind of a process and, and violence and national conflict constitute again and again separation and divide between Israel and Palestinians. It is a reminder of the power of violence as a formative, uh, of, uh, as a formative of identity separation and, and distinctions. So going back to Hell story. In this environment of hostility and dehumanization, most of the representation of the story in the Israeli press and others were seen all her uh, you know, connection, uh, you know, relation, uh, identification with the group, and uh, it's all a tactic to win some time, to win them, to destroy them. Nobody will see it as something that really brings the, you know, show us the connection between cultural that are, uh, you know, there's a cultural connection, there's a historical connection, there is, uh, uh, the, the fact that the, the militants see her and saw her as uh, like his mom or his mother is because of this proximity, it's not because something else uh, happened. And she, when she's told him, I'm like your mom, but I'm not sure that she only did it because of the tactic. Okay, so it's not only, only tactic, but in that kind of environment of violence, of separation, of, uh, of, uh, uh, you know, uh, the second and third generation of Mizrahi doesn't really understand this kind of history. Nobody can really imagine that this is a human interaction that shows us the tragedy of what could be happening if there wasn't this kind of violence. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm finishing. So I, uh, I'm going to finish. So I, I think in, in, in previous rounds of violence, I always found myself more strongly going drawn to the study of the history before the partition between Jews and Arabs to try to look for, uh, find the possible models and broken, you know, for the broken and violent present uh, to produce language beyond the logic of partition. In many ways, that's, you know, I've 
framers are always going back in any circle and any cycle that there's sadly there's more and more of them. But in this time, I feel that the past also collapsed in on itself and does not allow the imagination of another future. You said you talked about how this rhetoric of liberation, saying that you know Hamas is doing this because it's liberating, um, is anti-Semitic. And I guess my question for you was, why do you consider that um, anti-Semitic? Oh, I, 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 don't, I don't necessarily think, maybe I wasn't clear, I don't think that, I don't think that making the claim that Israel's Israelis or Israel is acting as a liberator here is is anti-Semitic. I, I think it's colonialist. Um, uh, I, I think that that kind of language is a convenient justification for a particular kind of activity that may be justified under just war theory, but is not justified and, and really doesn't have the potential in my mind to meet any objectives. I mean, to say that, you know, to say to, just to bring it down to the, you know, the, to say to a mother whose family is dead and whose house is destroyed, we've come to liberate you. I don't think that's gonna actually gain much traction. So I, I think that it's colonialist in, 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 in structure and I think it, it doesn't have a chance in hell of meeting the objective. And the objective is basically um, very simply to, um, to convince people living in Gaza that, um, they have a, they, that their lives will be better um, abandoning Hamas than supporting Hamas. And uh, you know, as Thomas Friedman once said many years ago, that the battle has always been about the Palestinian street. It's not really against an organization like Hamas, which, for which there is no possibility of compromise. It's really for the Palestinian living and trying to, you know, um, you know, care for their families to basically say, you know, it, 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 with what side am I going to have a better life? And I think that to come in and to, to demolish neighborhoods and then say we're liberating you, I just, I just think on a purely practical, purely practical way, I don't think it really can um, can meet that objective. So I, I didn't mean to say it was anti-Semitic. I just think it's colonialist. Wait, I'm sorry to clarify. It. it was something at the end of what you said about what Hamas is doing as liberation was anti-Semitic. Um, it was at the very end of what you said. I, I, um, I was just wondering, like, why that why that rhetoric of hum, what Hamas did is like how is that. I'm trying to see, think if I actually, if that's actually what I said. Um, I think that um, <laughs> it's very interesting because, you know, I was just teaching Fanon recently. I think that, um, I think that that mass death is anti-Semitic. I think going and killing 1400 civilians is anti-Semitic. I don't feel like that's an act of liberation. And maybe that makes me a kind of, you know, in some way an anti-Fanonian. I don't really think so. I have a different reading of Fanon, but nonetheless, I don't think that that was an act of liberation. And I don't think that was an act of legitimate resistance. Um, I'm not saying that the Palestinians have no right to resist occupation. I think that they do. Uh, but I don't think that that was a legitimate form of, of, uh, of, of occupation and it, and it didn't it didn't really liberate anything and I think that um, Hamas probably knew that I mean it was a provocation that was intended to one take hostages and two to try to evoke a regional war and it succeeded in one but it didn't succeed in two.
Speak loudly. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, so I guess my question, you had described the, the language of, you know, saying that Israel is going in to liberate Palestine as colonial. Um, I think some people see it, you know, in contrast to like what um, was done in Algeria or Iraq. I think some people see this as, you know, the uh, as Hamas in Gaza poses a real legitimate security concern for Israel. So I guess my question is, how, in your opinion, should Israel deal with the security concern and, you know, ensure the safety of its people without, um, like, what is the better way to do it that's not going to have these negative consequences? In, in other words, what that's should we be doing? Great. I mean, that's a good question. Again, uh, you know, I'm not a I'm not a military historian, nor am I, a, you know, somebody that deals with this. I I don't really, um, I don't really know the answer to that. Um, I, I when somebody asked me recently at a forum we did here at Harvard after the war, like the kind of classic question when um, when when talking talking about this of saying like well what's the solution and in a certain sense what you're saying is that in another form and my response to her was in this paradigm there is no solution i think the only solution is a complete change of paradigm and i don't really see that happening and so um you know if you want to make the argument that this is about security um i think that's fine and then you can ask the question about whether this kind of military operation will will um, will result in the kind of security that you want. I think the the best case scenario that I can see, I mean, I don't see that eradicating Hamas completely is really a possibility. It seems to me the best case scenario would be uh, that Israel buys time, maybe a decade, maybe 15 years. But I don't really see, given the given the Given the, par given the paradigm of what exists in Gaza, it's hard for me to believe that it's going to do anything else. Um, does that mean, that, is that something? Yes, of course that's something, 10 or 15 years is something. But I, I think that from my perspective, the reason why um, Israel can't eradicate Hamas is because the next generation of Hamas has not even been born yet. And, and I think that um, unless, um, unless that somehow changes, that's what we're dealing with. Um, thank you very much. Can you hear me crystal? Yeah, I can hear you. Just speak loudly. Oh, I didn't really come, but, you know, virtually. <laughs> um, I, was, I was just wondering, so Hamas was, uh, I guess, elected, but, um, you know, I forget the exact date, but, like, early in the 2000s, and now there's kind of not been really a democratic process since. So I was wondering, um, uh, in kind of your view, how much support does Hamas actually have from the, Pal uh, from the Palestinian people? Um, and kind of where do you see that going after this, uh, with this conflict? Um, and how do you see that kind of, you know, impacting, I guess, continuing the conflict? Because like you said before, um, the change really needs to happen on the streets. So I just wanted to hear your perspective on that. Thank you for that. Um, it's a good question. I think that um, some people, some people have said that, uh, well, all, there are no innocent Gazans because the Gazans voted for Hamas. And if they voted for Hamas, then they're party to Hamas. I think that's somewhat simplistic. I think people vote for who they vote for, and I think people voted for Hamas for a variety of reasons. Very people voted for Hamas early on because they were providing social services, because they were providing medical care, because they were providing all kinds of other things. Yes, they also had this. They also had this genocidal um, uh, attitude towards the state of Israel. But in terms of their lives, people felt that Hamas was better than the very obvious and and um, and and continuous corruption of the PA and, and we have to remember something here and here he, so the irony runs deep it's 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 widely known and this is not a provocative statement that Israel helped helped create Hamas in the 1980s partially as a way to drive a wedge to make sure that there wouldn't be a unified Palestinian front to argue for a Palestinian state now 
that's not to say that they created what happened on October 7th and are therefore responsible for it. But, you know, this, the history of Hamas is, um, is more complicated than what happened on October 7th. I mean, I think that um, how much support, I, I, I you know, I, 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 in a certain sense, kind of hate to say this, but I think, and we've seen this, I think at this point, I think the more Israel bombs Gaza, the more support Hamas has in the street. Um, and not only not only in Gaza, but as we see in the West Bank. So I don't think I don't think bombing Gaza to smithereens is going to basically get most Gazans to say, "Oh yeah, we'd rather actually side with the Israelis uh, than with Hamas." And I don't think that Israel thinks that either. I think it really is, as I said, I think as much as this is a war of of, of vengeance, it's also a war of honor. And I think that that's something that is not really kind of hasn't really gotten a lot of play uh, in the media. And and by the way, wars of honor are legitimate. I mean, they happen all the time. They've happened as, as long as human beings have existed in collectives. There have been wars of honor. The question is, how far does that go and whether it achieves its objective? So in, in relation in, in response to the to this support of of Gazans for Hamas, again, People vote for who they vote for for all kinds of reasons, and um, the more they say, the more they see Israel as the enemy, the more Hamas's narrative of Israel being the enemy is affirmed. Wondering if you might be able to speak to, as a point of comparison, um, the relationship between Jews Rafim and the Palestinians in the West Bank, maybe post Oslo, as a either comparison contrast maybe uh, in the Gaza and the West Bank. So I think that the, uh, it's, it's a good question. I think that the, 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 the question of Mizrahim, I would say it may be differently. The question of Mizrahim as such, as such a book, book is that something that definitely was studied by wanted a better life, couldn't afford it in the Jerusalem center, wanted to buy a house, the cheaper and the better than project offered them that. And many of the big cities, like Ariel, like Manazim, uh, the big settlements, there is a big, uh, large community. Him also in other places, also offered that are uh, less, in the beginning, were less aligned with the ideological uh, project of the settlement, but in, with time, definitely were aligned. Most of the Jewish Israelis went right, and I think definitely the Mizrahim gathered them as a generation also in other places. But it's a different kind of generation and connection than I would say the, the, the one that lived in the next next time. Uh, because that one came in the 1950s, 60s, and when Gaza was open in 1967, many of them went there also as a way to connect. Going straight to the settlement project. Some of them didn't have the ideological project, but with time, definitely came, you know, more with more connected to the project. I, I actually had a very similar question, so maybe you don't get that. Just ask it slightly differently. Can you talk, Professor Every, a little bit more about the connections and intertensions between kind of cultural? Connection between the Mizrahim and, and, and Palestinians or Arab Israelis and the presence at, early on of, of Mizrahim in many Israeli writings? I would say differently historically. Historically, the, the, my project and my work was in the beginning of the Zionist movement, and most of the people that were in the place, the native Palestinian Jews, 
Mr. Donkey. And most of them were definitely in the beginning, even the ones who were experienced at the time, were very critical about the second idea process. So they didn't want to integrate with uh, our population. They told me to our uh, to the Hebrew neighbor, they didn't study Arabic, to create a, a bilingual kind of community. So in the beginning, the the Mizrahi elite with the Muslim slaves were definitely more promoting the connection with Arabs. Uh, in the 1950s came another, you know, and of course I think that one is Dr. Hillary Cohen that wrote a lot about the history of violence. He says, I, I don't agree completely with his view, but he said that 1929 was the moment that this kind of Arab Jewish, uh, local Arab Jewish, uh, Palestinian Jewish vision of living together was erupted because of violence, because of this violence. In 1929, the mid-50s, that the Jews were the victims of it, and they, they wanted to say, okay, then to the economy. That's the moment that they went to, not to the Haganah, to the other side, to the enemy side. That, that's, the way, that's the moment that they saw themselves. We need to fight for survival. It's one of the moments. Another wave came in the 19, after uh, the 1948 war and the, the mass immigration. So some of the people that came, definitely with the elite, were communist uh, Jews from the Arab countries, uh, from Iraq, from uh, Egypt, uh, some of it from Morocco. And there were some of them, again, with the elite, were aligned with the communist Palestinians. Promoting so you have always a lack. There is the history of Mizrahi life. That's becoming smaller and smaller. I think all the Jews have become smaller, but definitely the Mizrahi life. And then there was other groups. But, but definitely one of the moments that the Mizrahi became right wing, or aligned with it, I think it's the moment that they need to prove that they are not Arab. And to show that they are not in this middle, and starts from the 1920s on, because they are always being suspected as one that can, you know, can blend with Arabs, so to speak, Arabic. They, they, they look like Arabs, and they, they have Arab neighbors, some of them partners, and, and when they're coming in the 50s, the same, same thing. So they had in a performance way that sometimes to show that they are not Arabs, and they're, they're even anti Arabs. Uh, so that may be the, the moment that it will come. But today, I, want, you know, it, I think it's a myth to say that only Mizrahi was that way. Right? So, so. And they are not the ones that uh, to blame to. <laughs> they are definitely now going in growing numbers, but sadly, I think most of the uh, Israeli Jews are going in the same direction. Thank you. Do you think that um, Arab Jews in Israel, when they felt like they had to prove their Jewishness, do you think that's kind of a response to that they were treated like Yeah, that's a good question. I think that the, 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 the same kind of um, partition that happened between the Arab and Jew, between these two loyalties, happened the same with the conflict going on, strongly only already in the communities itself, in Iraq, in Syria, uh, in Lebanon, in uh, less, I think, intensity in Morocco, in, in, in uh, Egypt for a certain moment. So the local Arab Iraqis will see them as Zionists, even though most of them weren't as such. But definitely, that was a moment that uh, this kind of, um, you know, mixed or, you know, conflicting loyalty started. Uh, and, and when it came to Israel, it was the opposite. They were looked as Arabs and not as Jews. Uh, and, uh, yeah, definitely, that it's, the, you know, the national paradigm that splitted this kind of identity, the two different identities that split in, that is part of the tragedy. So, thank you both for speaking. Um, do you think that what we're discussing now really contributes to then the crisis of imagination that you brought up at the end? Because how can we have change without imagining a better future? And if it's this constant struggle and push and pull back and forth, then how do we move towards that new narrative is really a big question. Is it what people actually want? Yeah. I, I think it's, it's a question for both. Yeah. <laughs> you want to ask this question? No, no, I agree. Uh, so, have you, uh, have you heard the question? Okay, I didn't hear that, yeah? Uh, it's, it's a question about uh, the, the limits of our political imagination. Something like that. You want to ask it? Perfect. Uh, are, we, are we living now in a, in a moment of closed imagination? 
imagination. Uh, and what Yuval said, something about the history of this closure. So can you answer this? Uh, Yuval, maybe you will start. Okay. With uh, so I think it's a great question. You know, I'm, I'm getting with it all this. Uh, I think that what made me even more sensitive is that, you know, for many years, you know, the, as we I said, the, the Palestinian Jews in the early 20th century, and then some of the Arabs would say, we need to speak Arabic. Right? We need to be, and now, I know, again, this was a scrolling week, and it's taken so while. So they bring in lots of people that say, and some of them is Nazi, some of them is an Iranian Jew, that we need to start speaking Arabic with what the, what they mean Arabic is not the language actually. It means to me is this racist uh, assumption that Arabic means violence, that they know only violence. So there is this, that's the only way now that we can speak about Arabic. That Arabic is to be, you know, and we, we need to be enough with this Western culture, we need to be Middle Eastern. Exactly what the people said, but the opposite interpretation of it. So now to be in the Middle East is to be, uh, for me, currently it's European, but for them it's like this is the Middle East. So I think that's, that's for me, the limit is the limit even of, of words that used to have different meanings. And now you can even, that somebody else will claim it back. You know, I was part of a Mizrahi struggle for years, activist. And we, for years, called it about the sec one, the second Israel and first Israel. And now Netanyahu and his friends are claiming that they are the representative of second Israel. So even the word second Israel, the word Mizrahi uh, identity is, is have a Connotation now in the Israeli discourse, uh, and uh, how we can reinvent new words—I don't know how we can do it. Uh, in that sense, that's why I'm very despair. You know, we need to have a new, maybe a new paradigm, as, as Shaul said, a new, you know, word that we need or discourse that we need to invent. I, uh, if if I, I if I can, I mean I, I I like I really like the language of closed political uh, imagination. And I think it actually captures something very important and much broader than than where we are now with the war. And 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 here, you know, I would take you know El Shochat and Aziza Khazum and Yuval and the people that have been actually doing important work on this process. Um, of early Zionist de-Arabization of the Jewish population of the North African and Yemenite and Iraqi and Iranian immigrants to, to Israel, that the Zionization process was a Europeanization process. And to be Arabic, to speak Arabic, to dress like an Arab, to eat the food of, of the Arabs was there was a cleansing process. It was a cultural, it was a cultural move to cleanse the Mizrahi population from a particular kind of Arabic culture in order to be part of this larger Zionist, this new, this new, to be the new Jew, right? And of late, there has been, as Yuval said, there's been an attempt to kind of from within the Mizrahi community. And, and, and I'll give you one example um, that uh, that expresses the beginning of that resistance happens in 1971 with the founding of the Israeli Black Panther movement, which was an intent, in a sense, a Mizrahi movement, which was attempting to contest and resist the Ashkenazi-centric government, which was the labor government at that point, um, and to kind of confront the discrimination that was happening within within those communities. I think of late there has been a kind of new Mizrahi youth culture that has emerged, but but I will say I will say that part at least and I here I'm leaning very much in El Shochat's work, but part of the de-Arabization movement within Israel culturally was precisely to separate the Jew from the Arab, precisely to drive a wedge between the Palestinian population and the Jews who came from Arabic countries. And I think that that process in, in many ways has been successful, but I think what it does is it really, it, it only further alienates or double alienates the Palestinian population because it's not only that they are politically um, marginalized, but they're culturally marginalized as well.
Thank you very much for joining us.